Hi, thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and in this video, I will be talking about William Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, a very famous poem, and there's a lot that we could talk about. I'm, of course, not going to be talking about everything related to the poem, but I want to give you uh, a basic reading, an introductory reading, talking about it, of course, as a dramatic situation, as an interaction between a speaker and a listener, and also to talk about it as a reflection on figurative language, as a way to think about how figurative language works, and an extended example of figurative language in operation. To begin with, we always want to think about a poem as a dramatic situation, again, as an interaction between two characters, two people, the speaker and the listener. In this poem, the form gives us some very important clues to understanding who the speaker and the listener are and their relationship. This poem, as the title tells us, is a sonnet, and sonnets are traditionally used as associated with love poetry. Sonnets are not always love poems, they're not always expressions of love, but that's the situation most commonly associated with the form. So when we think about a poem as a dramatic situation, a communication between a speaker and a listener, one of our first questions is, what's the relationship between these two? If the poem is a love poem, as the sonnet form suggests, what sort of questions, what sort of specific questions might we want to know about the relationship? For example, if the two people are already in a relationship and in love, that's going to be a very different situation than if one person is wooing or courting the other. It's just one of many issues that can affect the relationship, define the relationship between the speaker and listener, and thus shape the situation that we read the poem in. The situation will be different if one of them doesn't know about the other's affections, or if one or both of them are already in relationships, or if there's some social or economic or other difference that keeps the two apart. To simplify things, we can think about these differences uh, along two different axes. The axes of proximity, how close are they to each other, and the axis of hierarchy, that is their status relative to each other, is one higher or lower than the other. Like any poem, a love poem is going to express an unfolding of this relationship, perhaps uh, an evolution, a change of this relationship in terms of its proximity and hierarchy. This love poem may be attempting to bridge a distance, bring them closer in proximity to each other, or it might be trying to equalize the difference in status, or perhaps make one person higher in status. So we want to keep in mind that there's this range of possibilities as we attempt to bring this poem to life. As we read the poem, we'll see how the language starts to shape our understanding of the relationship between speaker and listener. So we're looking for how does the language help us to understand, how does it communicate the relationship between them and its development. Another thing to keep in mind is that if this is a dramatic situation, as we're understanding it, as we're imagining it, then something has happened to prompt this speech. There's been something that's happened before this poem to evoke this speech in the speaker. In this poem, the first line gives us a very important hint that signals, I think, both what's happened just prior to the moment of speaking that has prompted the speech, and also what the relationship, the nature of the relationship between the speaker and the listener is. And in doing so, it also helps us to understand what exactly the speaker is doing, what the speaker's purpose is. Because even though this is a love poem, there could be any number of different actions being undertaken in a love poem. For example, you could be writing a courtship poem to someone. This is your initial communication with someone. A love poem could be an act of flattery. A love poem could be an attempt at seduction. A love poem could be an attempt at a marriage proposal. So there could be all sorts of different things going on within a love poem or within a, an expression of love from one person to another. And again, the first sentence helps us to understand what the speaker's purpose is and also hints at how the action of his speech here is going to affect their relationship in terms of their proximity and hierarchy. The speaker asks in the first line, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So the speaker is asking a question, but I get the sense that this is a rhetorical question. That is, the speaker isn't really looking for an answer to it, but is asking the question as a first step in, uh, what, as an introduction to what they're going to be saying following. So this first line tells us what the speaker is going to be doing. The speaker is going to be making a comparison between the listener and something else in this case, a summer's day. 
And that's probably a pretty flattering association. We, our initial reaction is a summer's day is something nice, something positive. Comparing someone to a summer's day is probably going to be ultimately a positive action. Now I said that this line also hinted at what had come before. So I think, why would someone ask, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is the speaker is asking if they should do this in response to some expression, probably by the listener. Perhaps the listener has said something like, how beautiful am I? What do you think of me? So the speaker is prompted to give this, I think, by some question, some desire on the part of the listener. The speaker is fulfilling that desire by saying, okay, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? I'm going to express just how beautiful I think you are, just how much I love you. So I think that question, again, is in response to something, some desire that the listener wants. So let's think about, on the one hand, that this speaker is therefore trying to respond to, trying to fulfill some desire of the listeners, perhaps to be praised. The line also suggests something about their proximity and uh, hierarchy relative to one another. In proximity, it suggests a certain intimacy, or perhaps a becoming intimate. I don't think you would ask someone to flatter you if that person was not at least somewhat close to you. And I don't think you would feel free, the speaker would feel free to flatter someone that was a complete stranger. So we don't know exactly how intimate they are, how close the relationship is, but there is some closeness of communication, uh, some intimacy between the two, even if they're not necessarily lovers. In terms of hierarchy, if this poem is a comparison, a flattering comparison, an attempt to flatter the listener's desire to be praised for their beauty, then in that act, it creates a hierarchical relationship. By praising the listener, the speaker implicitly raises the listener above themselves. So the listener is higher in the hierarchy than the speaker, at least initially, just by the very act of praising that person, by saying how beautiful they are, the speaker puts them on a pedestal pedestal, so to speak. With that in mind, I'll read the poem. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. What have we said about the poem? That it's an act of flattery, and it flatters through this comparison. Comparison of the listener to a summer's day. I focus on this poem as an act of comparing things because not only is that central to what the speaker is doing, but it also, I think, helps us to understand figurative language. Essentially, what figurative language is, as I've said, is comparing things, is talking about one thing in terms of another in order to explain it. So in this poem, the speaker is talking about the beauty of the listener in terms of a summer's day, comparing him, comparing the listener to a summer's day in order to say just how beautiful and wonderful and lovely and how much the speaker loves this listener. The speaker is taking the language used to talk about one thing, the weather, to talk about something else, the beauty of their listener. So essentially, the poem is one long metaphor, one developing metaphor, or what's called a conceit, that is an extended metaphor. And how does the metaphor develop? How does it work? Well, in the second line, the very second line of the poem, the speaker answers the question that they raised in the first. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. That's the simple answer to the question in terms of how beautiful is this listener? Well, they're more lovely and more temperate, that is mild and balanced than even a summer's day. So it's a very flattering it's a very flattering comparison. And in a sense, it could end right there. That's the end of, that's enough to give a sense that the speaker thinks that this listener is wonderful. The speaker goes on in the next six lines or so to 
enumerate all the ways in which the speaker outstrips, outshines a summer's day, all the ways in which the speaker is better and a summer's day is inferior. Let's look at the various negative attributes the speaker gives to summer uh, and to a summer's day in order to show that it is inferior than the speaker, or excuse me, than the listener. It says, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. So we have the rough winds and the darling buds of May. So what are the darling buds of May? What is budding in May? Probably flowers, the flowers that are just in bloom from spring, and they're darling. So that gives them a sense of being infantile, childlike, beautiful, delicate, and they're being shaken by these rough winds. So there's a certain harshness even to a beautiful summer's day. It can be harsh. Next complaint that the speaker makes is that summer's lease hath all too short a date. Lease, so it's, it's something that's loaned, something that's not owned permanently. Summer is only here for a short period of time, only for a few months, and then it goes away. The implicit comparison is that the, the listener's beauty, on the other hand, is not temporary, is not going to go away like the summer's. The summer can be rough. The speaker, excuse me, the listener is gentle. Summer is only here for a short time. The beauty of summer only lasts for a few months before it disappears. The beauty of the, of the listener will not disappear. You may already notice a problem with the nature of the speaker's praise, but we'll come back to that. After these first two complaints, the speaker then goes on to elaborate on them even further. First, we have a description of summer's inconstancy, its changeability. Sometimes the eye of heaven, the sun, is too hot. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines. Sometimes during the summer it's too hot. On the other hand, often is his gold complexion dimmed. Sometimes the sun is blocked by clouds. Sometimes the sun is not out. So the summer's day isn't perfect. Sometimes the sun's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's too hot, sometimes it's not warm enough. So summer has this flexibility, this fluctuation, this changeability and inconstancy. Implicit in this comparison is that the listener has a certain constancy, again, permanency, does not change, is not variable the way a summer's day is. It will, the, the listener is always perfect, whereas a summer's day may or may not be perfect and often isn't perfect in one way or another. Next two lines, the speaker returns to the idea of summer's temporary nature, that summer is only here for a short period of time. And every fair from fair sometimes declines. Every fair thing, everything that is beautiful or fair, sometimes declines from its own fairness or from that state of fairness. Everything that is beautiful grows older and with the passage of time grows less beautiful. The beauty is lost. The beauty decays over time. And why is this? By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. Untrimmed means to be uh, have your clothing or your, your uniform removed, to have your outer layer uh, removed. So nature's changing course, just the path of nature and time, untrims us all of our beauty, untrims all beautiful things of their youth and beauty. Or chance will do it. By chance, something will lose its beauty, something will happen. So in these two lines, the speaker is coming back again to the idea of summer's temporary nature, that summer is only here for a few months, but it extends, the speaker extends this into a meditation on the temporary nature of all things. All beautiful things must decay. All beautiful things will eventually decay. That is the, the nature of nature. That is the nature of change. That is how time progresses. If we had any problems, if we had any questions after the first four lines, we should that those questions should be pretty explicit right now. Because if this is a comparison where the speaker is saying, you're better than summer, you're more lovely and more temperate than summer, summer has all these problems, it's sometimes too hot, it's sometimes not hot enough, it's sometimes too rough, and it's not forever, it's only temporary, it doesn't last forever because all things, all beautiful things decay. And if that's the, the comparison and the speaker is saying the listener is better than summer, then the speaker is somehow saying that the listener's beauty is permanent. 
Of course, we know just from the reality of biology that all people grow old and die. Everyone will grow old. Everyone's beauty will decay. Everyone will eventually die. So nothing is permanent. The speaker has, has, in, has basically said so themselves. And at the same time, the speaker is implicitly commenting on the idea, is implicitly comparing the listener to the summer, saying, you're not like this. You're not. Your beauty is not temporary. So that's a problem because, of course, the listener's beauty must be. Is this listener not human, not mortal? Even if the listener is a mountain, that even the mountain will eventually decay and die. So a problem has been raised by this speaker's praise. In attempting to praise the listener, the speaker has gone perhaps too far and given the listener, uh, praise the listener for something that is impossible, for immortality. Let's look at the last few lines to see how the speaker solves this problem and in doing so radically transforms the nature of their relationship. The speaker is has anticipated our question and the listener's question. Well, if everything dies, if summer is only here for a short period of time and everything that is beautiful eventually decays and dies, what are you saying about this listener? How are you saying that I am, am somehow not subject to this, this changing course of nature? So the speaker anticipates that and says, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. We have the real summer of the year, the summer that, that's the season, that has a, a temporary lease that's too short. But this listener, their beauty is called an eternal summer, a summer that never ends. Thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Owest here means ownest, so that, that you own. So he's saying, your summer will not fade. Summer is temporary, but your summer isn't. And your fair, even though every fair from fair declines, everything that is beautiful eventually loses its beauty, you will not lose possession of your fairness. Directly contradicting everything, this happens to everything else, but not to you. And why not? Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So we have here a personification of death. Death will not brag that you are in his shadow or that you are in his realm. There will never be a time when death will say, ah, look, I have this beautiful person. Death can't brag that it has taken you and taken your beauty. And we have a rather strange line, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. What are these eternal lines that they're, they're growing into, this, the listener is being said to grow into eternal lines. These could perhaps be, are these the, the lines of, uh, uh, of one's offspring, lineage, right? that they're saying this person will grow, um, that, they, that they, their eternity is through their offspring, that they will be here forever. Lines also brings to mind perhaps the lines that you get on your face as you grow older. So even though you may grow older and may develop lines on your face, your beauty won't die. There are a couple of possible meanings for lines, but it's a little unclear. Let's look at the, the final couplet, because that I think will both help us to understand a little bit more what lines is, and also give us this answer to the question, how is it that this listener is immortal? How is it that the listener's beauty will last forever when summer's doesn't, when nothing else's beauty does? So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So the question is, what is this? What is the this that the speaker is referring to? The this that the speaker is referring to is the poem itself. As long as there are men around who can read, as long as there are people living who can read and see this poem, they'll read these lines and the lines give a certain life to you. The lines, because they describe how beautiful you are, because they describe the eternity of your beauty, that your beauty outstrips the natural beauty of a summer's day, outstrips the beauty of the sun. They will read this poem and your beauty will still be alive. This adds yet another possible meaning to that, that phrase, eternal lines. What are the eternal lines in which the, uh, the, the listener is growing into eternity? The lines of the poem themselves. 
It's these lines that are eternal. It's through these lines that the listener is kept immortal, that the listener's beauty is preserved, that all will know of the listener's beauty. It's the lines that are eternal then, and by discussing, by describing the listener, the lines give that immortality, give that eternity to the listener and the listener's beauty. So let's stop to ask, what happened to the relationship between the speaker and listener? As I said before, when you're complimenting someone, praising someone, you're implicitly putting them on a pedestal, raising them to a higher status. And so at first, we get that sense that the speaker is saying, look how wonderful you are, you're so perfect. And the level of praise is almost excessive, almost hyperbolic, right? You are even more beautiful than a summer's day, even more glorious than the sun, and your beauty will last forever, will be eternal, even though summer and all other beautiful things are only temporary. This is clearly effusive praise, excessive, as I said, almost praise. So the speaker is really putting this listener, almost deifying the listener. But at the end of the poem, when the speaker switches to start talking about exactly how it is that this speaker, that the listener's beauty will be preserved, that their immortality will be preserved, suddenly the relationship switches and the speaker becomes the empowered one. It's the speaker that has the power to record the listener's beauty. It's the speaker that has the power to make the listener immortal. Let's think about how, as a love poem, just how inventive and strange and creative this poem is. How, as an expression of love, it's rather unusual. On the one hand, we have the speaker flattering the listener, saying how beautiful the listener is. But on the other hand, the speaker making clear that it's their poetic ability that makes the listener's beauty immortal. So both flattering and also expressing a certain power. There is also expressing how much they love this person and their great affection for the listener, just how highly they think of the listener. But they do that by complimenting their own poetic skill, their own genius. Again, by saying it's these lines, this poem that I'm writing to you that makes you so beautiful. It's my expression of love. So we might think, is this poem about the listener or about the speaker? Is love about the person that you love or about you yourself? Do you love that person for them? Or do you love them because of the love that it brings out in you, because of the chance to love, because of the opportunity to be a loving person and to show that love to the other person? And is that person truly as wonderful and beautiful as you think they are, or is it your own making? Is there beauty, is there wonderfulness of your own making? Are you of your own projection, in a sense? I think this idea that love is at least in part a projection is nowhere more obvious than in the act of flattering someone, complimenting someone by describing them through other terms, by comparing them to something else. Because essentially what you're doing then is expressing your fantasy, expressing the imaginary terms through which you understand and love and desire that person. What's so fascinating about the speaker and what makes the speaker of this particular love poem, of this expression of love so intriguing is their insightfulness. The fact that this person expresses to the listener their projection, expresses their fantasy of the listener as an eternal summer a beautiful being that will never die, and at the same time acknowledges that it is a fantasy of their own construction, their own act of making a metaphor, their own act of figuring this person in a poem as a summer's day. So it's their own fantasy that in some sense the speaker is expressing his love for, or her love for. But to conclude, even though this is perhaps the most overquoted, oversighted, overused love poem in history, I think it really rises above the level of cliché in the way that it deconstructs love itself. It seems to be a straightforward compliment, a straightforward expression of praise for one person to another, but when we look closely we see that it raises all sorts of problems about really some essential paradoxes in the love relationship. That love is always at least bound up with your own fantasies, your own projections and desires, as much as it is about the person, the other person themselves. 
and that there's always a little bit of a contest, a power struggle in any love relationship. It makes it a great poem, I think, because all great poems, they take the conventional, they take the familiar, a situation that we all can imagine, expressing love to someone else, complimenting someone else, using a comparison as a form of flattery, and it makes it unfamiliar, shows us in our own reality, in our own experience, something that we weren't aware of before. And it makes us more aware, more alive, and more able, I think, to reflect on ourselves and the nature of our relations with other people and what really we want in a loved relationship and how it, what love really means to us. Before I get off on a tangent philosophizing about love, I'll end this video presentation there. If you have any questions, you know how to get in touch with me. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.